Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Wonderful to see everyone. Uh, as we begin today, uh, our first song is called Battle Belongs. That comes from Second Chronicles 15 where it says, Do not fear, do not be dismayed, uh, for the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. So regardless of everything we're going through, uh, uh, we know that we have a Heavenly Father uh, that is fighting a, our battle for us. So let's stand and worship Him.
Yes, yes. Ah, it's good to be in God's house where it's warm. Thanks for being here this morning. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, whatever your situation is, circumstance, we're glad that you're here. I pray the things sung, the things that are said would be of encouragement to you. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody feels welcome, not just our guests, but everyone. So after I pray, uh, take a moment and make those near you feel welcome here in church today. God, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I do thank you that it's warm inside. I was uh, just thinking about that this morning, that, yeah, it's cold coming here, but thank you for giving us a place to worship and lots of people uh, that we get to do life with, that we can encourage others today uh, with our presence and with our words and all that goes on. I pray that as the, as the God of the universe is the one who's in charge of all things, that you would encourage us and help us. There's people here that are facing some really huge uh, situations and people that are facing things that in you know that they might think aren't that big a deal uh, but we need you uh, in everything that we face and so we look to you the reason we're here is not just out of habit it's not just because there wasn't anything else to do uh, we're here uh, because we know we need you and so we pray that you'd meet us at the place of our need in your precious name we pray amen all right make those near you feel welcome thanks for being here Continue this morning.
final breath and it was finished but not the end he could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens rolled Go ahead and sit down. I did a painting last weekend and finished it up on Tuesday. It, I've been planning it a long time. I called it All In. I painted a picture of the, t the two boats, in my mind anyway, two boats that Peter and Andrew, James and John left uh, when they left everything to follow Jesus. And then I made a sunset or a sunrise, and it's like a new day dawning in their lives. And it turned out really well, but I was still tweaking it on Tuesday morning. 
uh, when it was, I think that's the day it was raining or something. Anyway, and I was adding a little bit of something to the nets that were at one of the boats. And then Nancy said, leave it alone. And I said, uh, well, th first I want to paint a picture of a fish jumping up out of the water. And she said, well, while you're at it, why don't you draw a Walmart bag on the shore uh, there by the Sea of Galilee. So anyway, her point was, I tend, and if you're an artist, you may do this too, I tend to just keep messing with stuff. I just keep seeing things that I need to mess with. And there comes a time when you just need to leave it alone. Churches can do the same thing. That is, you keep adding things, and you add things, and you add things, and you never allow something to, to, to die. You just keep adding and adding, and it becomes so much. And so back uh, during the pandemic, after it was over as a staff, we spend a lot of time thinking about what are the main priorities that we want to make sure that we do and uh, not reattach branches maybe that have died. And we came up with, and we've been looking at these, to abide in Christ, to proclaim the gospel, to go to build the church, and then today is the fourth of those four pillars or priorities that we came up with, which is to go make disciples. Um, the passage this morning uh, that we're going to look at is in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Uh, commonly referred to as the Great Commission, uh, when Jesus meets with the disciples shortly before he goes into heaven and gives them this commission of what's the most important thing for them to do. The 11 disciples are there. This is more, most likely, this is what Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, when he says at one time Jesus was seen by over 500 people at the same time. And so even though the 11 were there, there were a lot of other people who were there, many of them who did not believe when they saw him. And so this is this final uh, moment when Jesus is going to leave the earth. He, is assigned, he had told them ahead of time to meet him in, at uh, uh, Galilee uh, for this purpose. And so this morning we're going to look at these four verses. And in the context of these four verses, the uh, uh, four realities of, or three realities about Jesus and making disciples that we see here. Verse 16, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So there's others, people who are there. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus commanded the disciples to go make more disciples. And still today, Jesus expects those of us who are his disciples, those of us who are following Jesus, to be involved in making more disciples, that they would be followers of Jesus as well. And so as we look at this text this morning, the first thing I want you to notice as far as how we see the, what Jesus makes this the priority is that Jesus commands us to make disciples. He doesn't command us to make Baptists. He doesn't command us to make Americans. He doesn't command us to make conservatives. He commands us to make disciples. In this particular uh, text, the word disciple means learner, uh, that you learn. And so it's not just to baptize someone, but that you are to help them to learn what it means to be a fully surrendered follower of Jesus. And uh, that's a lifelong uh, reality. I was talking to one of my friends the other day, and he had preached a message, and someone Afterwards, it said it had gone really well. Someone asked him, said, that, how long did it take you to prepare that message? And he said, all my life. Uh, because it's the truth. Your God's always teaching us. He's training us. He's shaping us. He's making us more and more into the image of Christ. And so when he say, make disciples, that's not a, a six-month program that gets over with. It's an ongoing reality. Uh, Jesus commands us uh, to make disciples uh, while going. Uh, this text where it says make disciples, that's a commandment, that the make disciples. Uh, go, baptize, teach are all participles that modify make disciples. So the one commandment in all of this is make disciples. Make disciples while going. He says go and make disciples. Uh, going means that you have to constantly be leaving the realm of your comfort. 
Uh, some people go to the nations, other people go to their neighbors, some people go to the new person that uh, sat by you today, but you go, get out of your comfort zone where you're always thinking in terms of, how can we reach more people for Christ? How can I have an influence on other people, helping them learn, helping them become more like Christ? I'm going, I'm not, I'm not stagnant where I am, I'm in the process of going as far as reaching other people, literally, where it says, Go make disciples. It says, while you're going, is how, what it literally means, while you're going, uh, be in the process of making disciples. And we don't necessarily go to witness so much as we witness as we go. We, we are having an influence uh, as God works through us and everything that we're involved in. And that means um, as we go, uh, we can go into... You know, we structure ourselves as a church so that we have life groups, we have D groups, we have various opportunities... For the purpose of getting to know people, getting to incorporate new people into what we're doing, and it's through that that we are able to uh, impact the lives of other people uh, because we, you know, actually if you just learn how to listen and show up. I used to, I don't think I've said it in a long time, but I remember used to, I'd say, if you just stay alive and pay attention, you can grow a lot as far as a disciple of Jesus. That's, I mean, you can do that. You're, you're not driving this thing. You're just supposed to be learning as you go. And so while going uh, out of our comfort zone to reach new people, meet new people, be with new people, God can and will use you in the process of making disciples. That doesn't mean to always just be going helter-skelter uh, where you never really take time to even, you know, while you're talking to one person, you're looking over here at somebody else to talk to the next person. You're just going, you know, you need to plug in where you are for a while. Uh, when I was young, my dad uh, left me to uh, plow some land uh, with a 930 case, Terry Hamburger's favorite tractor of all times. So I'm just kidding. He, he hated those just like I did. But uh, anyway... And uh, it was at a place that was not by the home place, so he couldn't see what I was doing. And I got this bright idea. I can put this thing in fifth gear, and I can get it done uh, in a hurry. And, uh, I, and you just plow it real shallow, and it looks like it's plowed, but it's not really plowed. And the problem came when Daddy showed up before I was done. And he basically said in uh, so many words, uh, put your plow on the ground. It's not a matter of just making it look good. In the same way in our life, as you go... And are you making disciples and you're influencing people? That doesn't mean just go as many people as possible. Where you are, let God use you to make an influence. He created the universe. He puts you where you are when you're there. And where you are, it, that's where you plug in. And so Jesus commanded us to make disciples while going, uh, while baptizing. It says baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and part of what we do as a, as a church and as the kingdom of God, that people are baptized after they make a profession of faith. After they trust Christ as Savior, they're baptized. Uh, some of you will have in your life group lesson today, uh, there's a section in there about baptism, which is very good. Um, uh, baptize means to plunge or submerge. That's why we baptize by immersion is because it's a picture of uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That the person being baptized, it shows they believe that Jesus died, was buried, and was raised from the dead. It's a symbol that's lasted for over 2,000 years. Same thing. Uh, you know, it doesn't say go and make, make disciples, teaching them to give a 200-word speech. Uh, it doesn't say that. Baptizing them. Uh, baptism is after, biblical baptism is after salvation by immersion as a testimony of faith. And it doesn't just happen in one particular denomination. It doesn't just happen in a Baptist church. Many of our members were baptized uh, biblically in other places besides the Baptist church, and that's great. Baptism is as a testimony of faith in Jesus, not as a statement of joining a church. I would say uh, that if you're a Christian and you've never been baptized, you need to for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a way of showing others that you've become a follower of Jesus and so it's a, a built-in testimony that Jesus established that it would always be shown uh, to everybody and then also it'll do something for you you are not saved by baptism but I can't imagine anyone that has been saved but not baptized that they would be assured of their salvation there would always be this little doubt like am I really all in or not did I mean that or not and baptism as a way of making it where you know I'm serious about this deal and I've surrendered my life to Christ. So 
part of what we do, and while we make, Jesus commands us to make disciples, uh, baptize, while baptizing. We don't baptize because we came up with this brilliant idea. It's because Jesus commanded us uh, to do that. And then also while teaching, he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That, again, that modifies make disciples. Teaching uh, all that he commanded us. So that means that baptism or salvation is not, to be, not the end, it's the beginning. And there's this process of teaching so that we help others. And we, got, we get the wrong idea. When we say teach, we think about somebody standing in front and everybody back there taking notes and filling in blanks. Teaching, I mean, it happens, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I never will forget uh, uh, Robin Carlin one time. People were saying, well, it bugs me when at the end of the sermon, everybody clicks their pen, you know, at the end before you know, they hear the pens clicking. And Robin said, well, it's certainly not me. I don't even listen to the sermon, much less take notes. Uh, so anyway, so that was, I appreciate her honesty on that. Uh, but teaching... Teaching is not just when somebody stands at the front and we're, it's like a class at, uh, at, at the university. Teaching is life on life, where we do life together and where we learn from one another and we share, yeah, we share truth, uh, but we also uh, share life together and we learn. We, you know, the school of hard knocks is highly overrated. A lot of things we can get around by just learning, for, by being and spending time with others. Uh, and again, as a church, we're organized for the purpose of we, have, we do this, we have worship together. Uh, and as the teaching, as the pastor, I share. Uh, but then also, we have the life groups where people, you study the Bible and also you get to know each other and you share life with each other. Same way with D groups. Um, I was with a man uh, just a couple of days ago before a burial at a cemetery. And we were talking and he's about 50 years old. And he's been in a D group for about a year. He said, I've learned more in the last year than I've learned in my entire life. Just because of the people he's sharing life with. And so, opportunities for learning, what we are to teach. Uh, and even in non-church situations, you're sitting at a ball game with other people that share faith in Jesus. And you, you, the interaction of life and as you do life together... Uh, we're always teaching, we're always learning, we're always growing, and that's part of it. So Jesus commands us uh, to make disciples. Secondly, Jesus empowers us to make disciples. Uh, he's, Jesus never asks us to do anything uh, that he will not enable us to do. And so when he says in verse 19, go therefore, therefore what? Well, because he says... Uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and, and earth. It's been given to me. So he empowers us to make disciples uh, by his authority. Uh, the authority he refers to in verse 18 is just that he's in charge of the world. He's in charge of, of the universe. And that means there is no person he cannot save. There is no shackle that he can't let go. There's no uh, confusion that he can't clear up. That we are basically just doing a job for him. That it's his authority. We are representing him as we make disciples. And he, he empowers us uh, to do that by his authority, uh, by his spirit. When we are saved, uh, following Pentecost, every person who becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit inhabits them, that we become uh, inhabited by the Holy Spirit. And he empowers us to face everything that we face in life. And he, part of that is he empowers us uh, to be a witness for him. Uh, some people are naturally salespeople. I mean, uh, you know, sell anything. Uh, other people are like me. Uh, when I was, when they had these fundraisers at schools, which I guess have been going on for 60 years, however long, but I remember I would just buy them all myself so I wouldn't have to go ask somebody. It just, that's me. But even though I'm not a natural salesperson, uh, I'm inhabited by the Holy Spirit, and when I interact with people, I'm not ashamed to tell them uh, that Jesus Christ has changed my life, and he can change theirs, and there's something about the, how it rubs off on other people because the Holy Spirit living in you empowers you to speak, and then there's something that happens as you interact with those who are not saved that influences them. And so Jesus empowers us to make disciples by his authority and by his Spirit. Causing endurance... 
It says here that the 11, verse 16, they went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So from the very beginning, there were people who didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. There were people that, if they doubted it, then that means there's probably going to be some opposition to what the disciples were preaching. There's probably going to be some laughter. There's going to be some opposing of what uh, the disciples were doing. But the disciples were able to endure. There's no trait more necessary to be able to make disciples of others than to endure. You can't quit. You continue on doing what God asks you to do, not because you see lots of results or because it's always glamorous, but because of the Holy Spirit within you, because of the authority of Jesus, that he will empower you and make you where you continue on no matter what. Uh, everybody in life has a hard time. You could make the argument that some people have a harder time than other people have, but the reality is that all of us face various things. If you live long enough, you're going you're gonna to face all kinds of stuff. God empowers us to continue on because if anything, the older you get, the more impact you can have because of the story that you have of God's faithfulness. And so... He wants us to endure. Uh, I was talking to Phil Neighbors Monday, and I don't know how, he, that guy just makes me laugh all the time. He, he's so encouraging. But he was talking about how God can enable anyone to understand Scripture, to continue on because it's the Holy Spirit. It's not what we bring to the table that makes us, us worthy. And then he said, then he made this statement. He said, I'm from Lake Creek. And you're from Kun Kazasi. And it's like, <laughs> so let me explain. Lake Creek is north of, you know where that is, north of Granite. Some of you don't know, but you hadn't lost anything. Uh, <laughs> Kun Kazasi is southwest of where I was raised. It was where my daddy went to school, where my dad was raised, about a mile from Kun Kazasi. And I never had thought about it before. But I was probably, as a crow flies, I was probably raised closer. I can't even say it. I was probably raised closer to Kun Kazasi than I was to Hobart. And his point was, a couple of farm boys from nowhere are still plowing the corn when they're senior adults and had plenty of exit ramps along the way. Don't be telling me you can't hang in there through cancer, through divorce, through death through disappointment, through what, I mean, it's just like, we don't know what's going to happen, and I'm glad that I don't. I've heard people before say, if I just knew what, I don't want to know. But as it comes, God gives us grace to deal with it, with endurance. And so Jesus empowers us to make disciples by his authority, by his spirit, causing endurance till he returns and says, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are never alone. He is always with us, and since he will be with us always, then until he returns or until we go to be with him, our mission is to make disciples, and he empowers us to do that. Uh, decades ago at Falls Creek, in the morning, after the morning tabernacle, they would have a Bible study time where it lasted an hour and a half, and different preachers preached or taught through different books of the Bible. I felt like, well, somebody's got to do it, so I would always volunteer to teach a book of the Bible for an hour and a half at one sitting with a little break in the middle. They'd ring the bell when it's time. Up. Okay. That was back in the day when they'd get the kids all up at the crack of dawn to eat breakfast after they'd stayed up till 1 o'clock or whatever. It was the most humbling week every year for me because I'm not five minutes into what I'm teaching and everybody's asleep. It's like, I don't know how this is helping, but I'm going to do it. And so you just keep on uh, doing what you're doing not because it's successful. I did figure out eventually I'd take a five-gallon bucket of candy and then I'd teach for a while and then I'd ask questions and if they answered them, I'd throw candy to them, kind of like feeding the seals. Uh, <laughs> even that didn't keep them all awake. 
But you just keep doing the right thing, not because it's successful, but because that's what God told you to do. And that's what you feel like is your responsibility. Jesus commands us to make disciples. Jesus empowers us to make disciples. And then finally, Jesus inspires us to make disciples. What a great situation it is uh, when we do what we need to do, not because we have to, but because we really want to. And he gets us excited about doing what, what it is we're supposed to do. And we see that Jesus inspires us uh, to do uh, and make disciples when we do th two things. As we worship him and as we walk with him. When they saw Jesus, it says in verse, eight, eight, or verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him. As they worshipped Jesus, recognizing who he was, it inspired them to go and obey him, to go and make disciples, that they were inspired to do it. Uh, that wasn't their only motivation, but they, the inspiration came when they worshipped. The word worship means to bend the knee. It means that I acknowledge the worthiness of Jesus. And when I acknowledge the worthiness of Jesus, then I realize that if he said go make disciples, I, I better go make some disciples. And I'm glad he includes me in that process and it inspires me to do it. Um, we worship when we sing together like we did before uh, today, but also worship takes place throughout the day. It takes place as you surrender yourself to God over and over again. It's an ongoing process that when I'm reminded of the fact that I am surrendered to Jesus Christ, he inspires me to want to be a part of the mission that he has to make disciples in the world. When, I'll get back to the music part. When we sing praise to God, our number one priority is that he would be pleased with what we sing. The, the other thing that happens as kind of a byproduct of that is it inspires us to go and do what God wants us to do. It should fire us up whenever we worship together. And then as we worship uh, in our time with God. And that's the second thing as we walk with him. It says in verse 20, And behold, I am with you always. And so we have this rare privilege as followers of Jesus Christ, that we get to read his word, we get to hear the words of God through the, through the Bible, and we read those and we walk with him day by day. He inspires us to want to do what he wants us to do. Yeah, I'm aware of various things in life, and we all are. We know other things that are going on, but we keep coming back to center that the main thing that I exist for now, whether my day job is being a preacher or a doctor or a, or a professor or a farmer or whatever, but I come back and the reason I'm in this world is to make disciples. And he inspires me uh, to want to do that as I walk with him. As I walk with him day by day, reading his word, talking to him, crying out to him, his heart becomes my heart so that I want other people to also be followers of Jesus for the glory of God, that when ultimately when everything is said and done, that the, the throne of God is surrounded by people from every nation and all of the world and many of the people that I know uh, that would give honor to him because, of, because, of, uh, because he's worthy. And so, make disciples. we got one job. Make disciples. Jesus commanded us to make disciples. Jesus empowers us to make disciples. Jesus inspires us to make disciples. Not just a one and done deal, but you stay involved in the lives of people and include as many people as possible to make them uh, where they also are like Jesus Christ. So, uh, Decades ago, it's, it, usually we, continue, we don't relearn really stuff so much as we keep doing things the same way we've always done them if we've learned things. And that's the way I am with sharing my faith. Years ago, I learned how, here's how I get into sharing the gospel. I talk with people about their secular life, what they do, you know, their job, their hobbies, whatever. And then I'll ask them about their church background, you know, what it, you know, have you ever gone to church? And then I'll transition to, it's not about church, though. It's about having a relationship with Jesus. That's just kind of my, that's, I was taught that, and that's kind of the pattern I follow. When I went to Atoka, there's a guy who showed up at church, which still, that, to, to me, that's the, the best prospects for people that are really seeking a relationship with God are people who show up at church. That's the first place they come, and uh, they, that's why we want to be welcoming, because they, Seth pointed out Wednesday night uh, when he was preaching that they already feel kind of odd anyway, or judged, and so welcome everybody with open arms. Well, this guy showed up at church at Atoka uh, with his wife and his three, and three girls, 
and uh, when you're in a when you're at Harmony Baptist Church in Atoka, you know everybody who's from an outsider. You know, so so I got his name and I figured out who he was and I went by to visit him, and uh, so I did the same. You know, did the deal. How's the you know, what, what are some things you like? Well, he liked OU football, and he had done this and that, and he had, and we talked about that. And then I said, uh, uh, so, did you ever, have you ever gone to church before? Because he had told me that was just the first time they had come there. He said, yeah, uh, when I was growing up, we went to church all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, till our mom ran off with the preacher. I was like, I've got 82 years, of, 82 hours of master's in theology. Nobody ever covered this. <laughs> and I don't know what I said. But he kept coming back. And I kept going to see him. And I found out his story. His story was that he had been saved when he was in high school, but he'd never been baptized. He'd gone to a youth meeting to sit by a girl, and he had been saved. And then he was baptized. And he, he's one of the guys, you know, I was baptized when I was young, so I don't remember a whole lot about it. Uh, but he said, whenever he was baptized, he said, Some, that did something for me. And um, he's all in. Well, I, we, I didn't know what a D group was or a whatever. It was just like we started meeting once a week, and he would read the Bible during the week, and then we'd talk about what he had read. And uh, he kept reading and kept growing. And then he came to a point that he was leading others. He's teaching and then at the low points in our lives as adults, I eventually moved away. And uh, I still remember I was going through a hard time once, and uh, I met him at, uh, at an OU ball game. Set in his season tickets. I, did, I don't have them, but he did. And um, it was so good to have someone who knew me well and loved me warts and all. And I've done the same thing for him. And the relationship continues. And it was all just, and, and my point is, that didn't happen in three months while we had a, I mean, discipleship is a long obedience in the same direction. And you need to include as many people as possible with you as you make that journey. Because this guy, now he's leading other people, he's helping other people. Uh, the best thing you can leave behind in life, the best thing a preacher can leave behind uh, when I left Atoka was not how there's a big new building. The best thing you can leave behind is that there's people all in and following Jesus. And just because you're not there, that doesn't have anything to do with it. They continue on. And that's why Jesus said, he commanded us, make disciples. That's the priority. He commanded us, he empowers us, and he inspires us to do so. Let's stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you uh, that your plan for the 11 is the same plan that you have for us. And that you let us get to be a part of what you are doing. Help us not to be driven by guilt or overwhelmed with inadequacy. But that we'd realize you live inside of us. You've called us. You'll help us and empower us to do what you've asked us to do. And uh, so help us never to grow weary, but to just keep on keeping on. And we pray your kingdom will come and your will be done as a result of that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be here at the front if I can help you in any way. If you need to trust Christ as Savior, you need to let me know you need to be baptized. You can do that as we uh, end our service this morning.
However, if I can pray with you in any way, you come as we sing.
All right, Merlin and Lillian are going to come up here, and David and Aaron. And I don't know if S Steve, here's Steve. Sure Steve yeah, Steve's here. And Randy, is Randy here? Okay, he's probably in still in life group. Uh, these are some of the 51 who are going to be going to Mexico. Uh, Merlin and Lillian are leaving today, and then the others will be following on Saturday down to Mexico. They're going to put a roof on an existing, well, they've got the walls up, but they're going to put a roof on that. And they're, they're net menders is what they're called. Merlin's the vice, the vice president of the national organization, been doing it for years and years. And they go and come alongside and help those who are involved in ministry in Mexico and to make their uh, work easier to come alongside and help. And they're leaving, so I want us to, as a church to pray for them and for their safety and their usefulness. Let's just pray. God, we do pray uh, that you would be with all 51 of those who go down to Mexico and as they do practical work to make uh, the ministry better there, Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Give them safety as they travel and use them while they're there. Thank you for the opportunity to go and make disciples and that they're saying yes to you. And as you've used them before, I pray you'd use them again. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Just remain seated. sa zdychavské lesy premenili na katedrálu. K orchestru spevavých vtákov a tlieskajúcemu potoku sme sa pridali my všetci. Štyria mladí ľudia sa rozhodli vyznať svoju vieru v Ježiša Krista a na svoje vyznanie boli aj pokrstení. Prišli aj naši vzácni hostia z Revúcej a z okolia. Tak sme spolu s horúcimi trdelníkmi a langošmi sa mohli pozerať okolo seba a diviť sa tejto kráse. Včerajší večer nám pripomenul, že obyčajné miesto sa môže stať neobyčajným kdekoľvek sme, keď sa Pán Boh priblíži k nám. church family. So wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much for being here today. A few things before we go. First, our Bible studies are starting back February 1st at 630. So that's going to be on Wednesday nights. So if you're interested, definitely attend one of those. Uh, next, we are having our 55 and up Valentine's Banquet. That's going to be February 12th at 5 p.m. over in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, so if you're interested in going, you can call the church office to RSVP. Uh, then we are having representatives from Hope is Alive and Branch 15 at a question and answer session at the gathering on February 15th. So it's going to be a wonderful time to hear stories and worship together. So you'll definitely want to be there. Uh, then last, we uh, want you to be in prayer for our Slovakian team uh, that is coming. They are going to be here this coming Thursday, and Pastor Richard is going to be sharing that Sunday morning and the following Wednesday at the gathering. So be in prayer for their travels and be in prayer for Pastor Richard as he prepares to share. Uh, so just be as welcoming as you can, uh, and we're really looking forward to having them with us. Uh, and before you go, we want to remind you to abide in Christ, proclaim the gospel, build the church, and go and make disciples. You're dismissed.